Okay. Uh, welcome everyone this evening to our event, first annual event of the Indigenous Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Shane McDougall. My Blackfoot name is uh, Siksagakwan, Blackfoot Nan. I'm from the Begani Nation and um, glad to have you all here tonight. I uh, see a lot of familiar faces out there, a lot of friends and family. Um, first of all, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Lethbridge is located on uh, Nitsitibi territory, um, traditional Blackfoot land and uh, home of the Siksagang Sitibi, the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, we'd like to acknowledge this and um, acknowledge all the Indigenous students that come here and go here from uh, not only Blackfoot, but we got Métis, Crees, um, Inuit, uh, all across Canada and the North America. So we'd just like to acknowledge that. And another small acknowledgement is um, from my friend uh, Blair Many Fingers. He would, wants to acknowledge uh, Riding on Stone. It's one of the biggest um, Indigenous rock art in North America, located right here in Blackfoot Territory. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll get started here. Um, I'd like to welcome our guests from um, across the border and here in um, Indigenous land all over North America. Um, our first speaker, we'll go uh, ladies first. Our uh, first speaker <laughs> is Yvonne N. Tiger. She's Cherokee enrolled, Seminole and Muscogee nations of Oklahoma. Is a PhD student in cultural, social and political thought program at the University of Lethbridge. A first generation college graduate, Tiger holds an AB degree from Smith College and two MAs for the University of Oklahoma in the 20th U.S. history and the Native American studies. Native American art history and curating conducted within OU's Department of Art History. She is an Indigenous art historian and teaches Indigenous studies courses at the University of Lethbridge and at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has held fellowships at the Peabody Access Museum with MOMAS Emerging Indigenous Critics Residency and Ostego Institute for Native American Art History. She was a scholar in residence at Smith College and is a 2021, 2022, and 2023 Cobell Scholar. Let's welcome Yvonne here. Okay. Our next one is um, Dr. Sean Chandler. Is an artist enrolled member of the Anayan Rose Venture Nation. He is also the president of the, excuse my, uh, my, my pronunciation, um, Anaya Nakota College, located on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana. He acquired a Bachelor of Arts in Art in 1997, as well as a Master of Arts in Native American Studies in 2003 from Montana State University, Bozeman. He also attended a Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership from the University of Montana in 2014 with his dissertation entitled The Identity of Indigenous Lifeways. In 2002, Sean began to focus his time on the efforts to restore his native language and develop an American Indian Studies program at the Anaya Nakota College, thus stepping away from his art full time. Upon completion of his doctorate in May, of 2014, Sean began to devote more time to his art while still fulfilling his duty, duties at ANC. Sean has always been involved in art starting at an early age when his father taught him traditional arts of his ancestors, including hide and teepee painting. Integrating those early teachings, Sean voices his own style to communicate the contemporary life he lives. Themes of racism, loneliness, depression, anger, humor, stereotypes, sovereignty, dependency, and cultural geno genocide reside within Sean's work. Welcome, Sean. Last but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Lee Francis IV, also known as the Dr. Indigenerd. Um, That's right. He is an uh, executive director of Native Realities, an Indigenous imagination company that it dedicated to unleashing the indigenous imagination to pop popular culture, including comic books, graphic novels, games, toys, and collectibles. 
Through Native Realities, Dr. Francis also founded the, the Indigenous Comic Con in 2016 and opened Red Planet Books and Comics, the only Native shop, comic shop in the world. In the world, in 2017, was now which now serves as the headquarters and distribution center for Native and Indigenous books and other media. He has written and published more than a dozen comics, and is a foremost expert on Indigenous pop culture media. He lives in North Carolina with his family. So let's welcome everyone here tonight. Well, uh, well uh, I don't know who wants to start off, but um, tonight's uh, theme is uh, radical. So I'd like to um, ask this question of the three. Um, given the theme of, of the evening, what is radical about your work, research, art, and contemporary Indigenous lifestyles? Oh man, <laughs> it is going to go this way. All right, Guati Hapa, the Wash Drake, the Wash Wash Rob, May Lee Francis, Washesh Kaweka May, Americana May, Tawae. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor Indigener Lee Francis. My family is from the Pueblo of Laguna, Kawek, um, from the village of Guati, which we call Quishchi at home. Um, uh, and and thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you for my hosts and my wonderful group of amazing native peoples and indigenous peoples up here so um yeah so it's it's that's a tough question i mean in that sense right because we're it's just like how are you radical i was like i don't know i'm i'm i consider myself just a nerd i think the work that i have tried to do um you know since way back I've, uh, you know has really been revolving around how do we find space for the stories that are not told. Um, so I think my work really revolves around storytelling and the radical nature of storytelling and how that is um, not only something that binds us uh, and, and in, in a good way, but uh, connects us, binds us, weaves us back to our cultural traditions, but has also been what has guided us through times of strife. Um, it's one of the things that we've held on to. Uh, even in those moments and as people rediscover and figure out their pathways back home, it's the stories. Uh, that hold us and and allow us to continue that that unbroken line of indigeneity that goes back since time immemorial. And I was raised in that kind of a family. So my family is a family of writers. Uh, and I grew up with writing and storytelling and music and poetry and art and and really swirling around that. And because of that, when I began my my educational path and my career path, it was working with Native young people about how and what is the best medium to tell those stories and those untold stories. And so that could be anything from poetry, so poetry slam, uh, performance and theater, that could be music and hip hop, that could be heavy metal, that could be, uh, for me, for comic books and graphic novels, that could be mysteries and romance novels. I think what I tried to do in my career is find all those spaces where Native and Indigenous voices are not represented in popular media and popular uh, colonial media, um, how to how to find that th those niche places um, so that we can represent who we are on a day to day basis. My company is called Native Realities. My organization is called Native Realities because that's what I wanted to emulate. It's the realities of being a Native person. It's the realities of being Indigenous in this world, and and that's what I've tried to live by. Right? It's not the mythologies that we often see. And that pop culture continues to reinforce, right? So for me, as a Pueblo kid, uh, yeah, I got the chance to speak to some students earlier. Same joke as before. I was like, Pueblo folks were really short and we're pretty round. And we were growers. We wrestle ears of corn. We're not, you know, like, we're not, we're not, you know, like, we're not horse culture entirely. Although we do have, you know, folks that ride horses, but that's not our, our, our kind of, uh, Mo going through this, we're we're farmers, we're planters, we're we're desert people, um, and in popular media, I don't see myself represented that often, right? So in popular media, what I see in that representation is fierce, you know, warrior stuff that is this counterpoint to the American intruders and all this other stuff. And I know I got relatives that are absolutely like that, but I know I got relatives that that are fisher people, right? I know I got relatives that are uh, rice harvesters, that are growers that are singers, that are artists, um, uh, you know, and that's that's their life. So that's really, for me, the native realities is trying to break away from those myths um, that 
that have been forced upon us that we still have to reckon with, uh, even to this day, throughout a colonial history. Um, and so I think the, you know, so, so the radical part of that work is really around, you know, finding those stories, finding those ways to tell those stories in a new and refreshing way that is representational of, of that lived experience, that truly lived experience. Um, and, and I think that, and I just, I just pick a nerd pathway for that. So that's the last bit of the radical part is I, I consider myself a huge nerd. I love video games. I love comic books. And so any way I can tell stories in those mediums, science fiction, space, native space rangers, monster hunters, stuff like that, that's totally right up my alley. So <laughs> perfect. Now you. My turn. Right on. All that. right. <laughs> my work is arguably not as exciting as Lee's. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I have the privilege of being um of having known these two brothers of mine for many years. And so it's really such an amazing experience to be able to be here with both of them. Um, two, two men that I think have done amazing things for our people, broadly speaking, and to continue to take up and create space and hold space for all my indigenous peoples out here, all my students as well. And um, it's really important. So I'm really uh, privileged to be here with them. And so as for myself, I mean, my work, I'm, a, I'm an art historian. That doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, when you start adding the ind indigenous aspect to it, it becomes something a lot more exciting. And so, because I don't wanna be standing there at looking at these, um, the things that are primarily hanging in the Met, right? Uh, they don't speak to me. They are mainly European and subtler art that doesn't have anything to do with the things that we've gone through as indigenous people on this continent. And so where does the radically come into my work? Uh, it comes in many places. Um, I think one of the last things that I've done in terms of publish publishing was an essay that I did for Sean's um, show. And one of my students, I read it to my graduate students, and I read part of it as, um, as an example of a formal analysis, I, my students will know what that is, a very deep looking at a piece of art and a conversation about that piece, which doesn't um, replace looking, but it, it pulls out all the nuances of it. And for me, of course, my students will know this, my favorite word is context. <laughs> and so our historical context is so vitally important to, um, to my work. And so my graduate student uh, referred to that piece because I read it to them as my love letter to Sean. And it was really a blessing and it and touched me to hear that work spoken of like that because I think that is one of the radical things I love to bring to my work is that I get to talk about indigenous artists. I get to speak about how we are sustained by the work that they do. And as I told Lee earlier, I don't get to do that without knowing our artists which is something that wasn't being done um, not that many years ago. Artists were really excluded from the work that we do as art historians. And so, you know, I can't do my work um, without understanding and knowing process. I can't do my work without understanding the history and culture of your people, because primarily they're not my people, but, you know, they're not my tribal people. And, um, so that's one, one place in which the radical um, comes in. And the other is that um, through just, just being an academic, an indigenous nerd for sure, um, I, I am working very closely in the realm of in, uh, refusal as theory and method in my work. And so right now, um, the part that I'm working on is indigenous critical citational practices. So what does that mean? It sounds really boring, but it really isn't. It really is a refusal to bring in the people that Western institutions consider to be like the gods of whatever discipline you're in, right? Those people who speak loudly and broadly. So there's many of them in art history. There's a lot of them in history. I mean, whatever department you're in, you're gonna have them. And I, I am very much refusing to center them in my world of indigenous art history because indigenous people are at the center of this world. And, you know, I'm not fighting with them. I'm just refusing that. 
And so that, that is a radical act of it, pure indigenous love and um, an intellect, indigenous intellectual practice. It's very indigenity. And, um, and I find that to be so generative. And what does that do in the bigger world? It makes room for indigenous scholars. And it also makes room for the people in the community because it means that I don't have to just accept the voices of people with PhDs, I accept the voices of people within community into my work and call that the citational pieces that I need to make my work full. And so one day, one day, my entire um, bibliography will be completely indigenous with, with some allies and accomplices thrown in. And, um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's my radical sensibility as an indigenous. So, and now it's Sean's turn. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> well, hey, Nanisa, Nitha Walk, Nanana, Aninan. I'm Sean Chandler. I'm from the White Clay people. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I want to thank Paul for bringing me here. Um, as you know, as I don't know, I think these two, Paul and Yvonne, know me that I tend not to like to talk about, you know, like, not, I don't like to talk much. I just like to do, I thought becoming an artist with my work, I thought I could just paint and then let it speak for itself. But it turns out you have, you have to do a lot of talking. Then I became a teacher in uh, Native American studies of all, you know, of all things. And, um, and now I'm the, the head of our tribal college in uh, North Central Montana. So, um, and anybody that knew me growing up, growing up would be surprised that what, you know, that I, I'm up here talking, but, um, um, and I am too, but when I, when I, but when I got the, uh, the question, I was thinking, oh gosh, radical, what am I doing? Uh, so I was over here panicking. I go, oh yeah, I got it. So uh, I went back to what I, what I always do when I think about um, a question or my life path uh, when, uh, when my great grandpa told my dad um, before he was going off to boarding school at eight, when my dad was age nine, <clears throat> he told him, uh, forget the Aani language or the, the Grovan language. You know, um, forget that. Learn English. Get good grades and be prosperous and generous. So my dad eventually did that. He worked for Xerox Corporation. Um, and he, but at the same time, he was being successful in, in the non-Indian world or the mainstream America world. He was still indigenous. He was still practicing his life ways and teaching them to us. The only thing we didn't get uh, of, of my brother and sisters, uh, we didn't get uh, uh, the language, but we got, you know, the philosophy and other things. Um, and we're still learning, of course. But um, so I was thinking about radical. I think it's existing, be, being successful in the non-Indian world and, and uh, practicing your, your indigenous ways. I think being, I think that is pretty radical because, you know, the, the goal of the boarding school, uh, that mentality was kill the Indian, save the man. And uh, I think we've overcome that. I think we, uh, you know, stayed indigenous under the radar, but now we're able to do it outwardly. And so um, when I grew up, I grew up in a town where I was the only, we were the only Indian family for the most part in a town called Glendive, Montana, in, in Eastern Montana. And so when I went to school, I was the only Indian. I had braids then too, uh, up till I was about 13, and then I cut them and grew them back. But, but uh, I was, uh, at five years old, that's when I knew, um, I started to realize what racism was, um, being made fun of for having braids uh, and things like that. And so I kind of drew in, I was more active or more outgoing uh, before that, but I became drawn in and probably uh, good or bad, I don't know. Uh, I look at my art and see how maybe tortured my mind is out of but uh, I sure like the way it looks. <laughs> so, uh, 
maybe something positive know, yeah. came, came <laughs> about it but but uh and then i be you know i became uh you know um old oh, like my show the one yvonne did the uh, and uh an essay for it for the catalog uh, was entitled The One Defined to Be No One. So two our indigenous people were defined to be nobodies. Uh, they never, they all you could, the message was that we could only go so far in life or in America. And there's several uh, Indian people that have, that have risen way above that. But there's others too that learn to uh, believe that, believe that we could only go so far or to be defined as nothing you know all these different definitions of who indian people are are they human beings are they animals are they savage or whatever they are and um along the way some of us have learned to believe all all of those those negative words and then we act out negatively as a result and um but i think in 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 my case you know, we have half of that. And then being, like I said, being quiet, drawing in, I had that doubly just in my immediate family or my extended family. They might have thought myself wouldn't be, I just, you know, oh, there's Sean, he's quiet, just let him do what he wants. Or, you know, he's just, you know, going to be Sean or whatever. And so uh, then they, you know, now I hear I am talking to everybody, um, which doesn't please me that much, but it's still hard. It's still hard, but I'll do it. And um, but I became an artist, and but along the way they said, "Don't become an artist because you'll be poor or you you won't amount to anything." And, um, I was so I was set off to be an electrical engineer. That was going to be that was my degree when I first started college, way back in the. Uh, the 1800s, yeah. 1980. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but I changed. I I wanted to define myself because you know we uh, have to please ourselves before we help anybody else. And so I switched to art. And then even that, when I switched to art, people were trying to define how I should be be an artist. You need to paint more positive messages. You need to paint the stereotypical uh, Native American, whatever. And all that did was make me worse. And then you see what I, you see what we have here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this is where I'm at right now in, in my work. And this one in particular is called Aanihilism of the Black Stallion. So even Aanihilism, what I, created a, a body of work or that show the one defined to be no one one of my friends from uh, white earth chippewa uh, named chad uran looked at my work and he uh he said uh oh, nihilism and you know kind of a combo of uh, nihilism and or nihilism and uh, ani which is you know part of our uh what you know white clay art what we call ourselves and uh and so I, I was thinking about that. Wow, does that mean, I, I still think about, does that mean the belief in the Aani or does that mean the belief in Aani and nothing? You know, is the nothing part the, uh, the non-Indian or the uh, Western worldview mixed with my own? I don't know. And I still think about that. But connecting to this piece here, um, I put the black, it has the black stallion on it. Uh, because my dad, when he, from third grade to eighth grade in uh, in Pierre Indian School in South Dakota, which was, you know, miles and miles away from our homeland at Fort Belknap, Montana, um, he was allowed to do the same book report from third grade to eighth grade of the Black Stallion. And so that's the caliber of education Yep. our people were given so again where we were only supposed to go so far and uh but he overcame that and you know so i think that's pretty radical and i hope you know i've hopefully carried that on and and yeah we look at and he tells me tells that story too and he laughs about it we laugh about it but i was thinking about it when i was doing this painting I go, you know that's really 
that's pretty bad. That's pretty sad. Yep. And he was lucky to, you know, become successful in mainstream America. But think of all the others that didn't make it the way he did. And um, so, so that's what I think being radical just is existing. And then also telling the story that nobody has heard. All right, that's it. We answered We're the question. Down. Thanks, man. <laughs> nice. I want to ask, so I think we what we said was we're going to kind of converse a little bit, maybe ask questions of each other, so that way you know kind of what's going on, unless you have more questions. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so one thing that I want to kind of tie onto this that got me thinking is around this sort of, uh, we'll put radical in front of everything, right? Because we put indigenous in front of everything now to make sure it's indigenous. So that's um, indigenous nerd, it's indigenous bacon, this is indigenous <laughs> art. I was like, we can just do it for everything. That's we're just reclaiming, right? But I'll put radical because I think this idea of radical rejection, right? And this radical rejecting of these, these um, frames, these boxes, this schema that has been put upon us this idea of like, oh, you know, we have to center, you know, non-native uh, theoreticians and academics and scholars in order for our work to be validated. You have to go into and do art that looks native, like the way, you know, like the 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 the, the Catlin, you know, uh, paintings, right? Like, and so, how is it in terms of this radical rejection? Um, I guess getting a little bit deeper from of of how is that played out in in your lives, and why do we think it's important? you know, for our communities, right? Like, uh, I guess it's a threefold question. And how do we keep doing that? Like you're an educator, you know, you're an, an educating, you're an artist educator, radical artist educator now. So like, how are you doing that in your classroom? How are you doing that with students? How are you doing that through your art? How is that radical rejection of the boxes and the form that's been put on us? How has that played out in your lives and your work? Go. Okay, well. Well, I work, well, part of me, you know, works at a tribal college in uh, Ani Nakota College, and it's based out of, uh, based on our indigenous lifeways, or the uh, Ani and the Nakota people. So our indigenous philosophies, languages are integrated, or they are the foundations of uh, the, you know, the education that we give there. And yeah, there's mixtures of, uh, of uh, Western world, Western thought, but it's founded upon our Ani and Nakota lifeways. And I always say, what if, you know, as, as you know, we were not able to practice our ways very much or at all um, for us, for the Ani, at least about the 1880s. And our, our, co our college was founded in 1983. And so I always think, wow, what if we were, what if we really did live in a free world and we were allowed to build a college in 1884, just like all of the Montana, well, where I come from, Montana colleges, they were all founded about 1890s. Um, and so I was thinking, what if we were allowed just to be and do that? We, we would have combined both worldviews, but boy, they would have really been heavily in our indigenous life ways. And just think of the knowledge, the massive amount of knowledge we'd have that could complement each other's worldview. And um, so that's how I do that in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. And um, I'll let you go. <laughs> that's nice, nice setup. I, I, you know, I don't know if there's any clean answer for how this works in my world. It's um, because it's, uh, it, since I'm purely in the academic world and then partially working within my field, um, when I get the opportunity, um, it, it really happens within the classroom, I would say, the, the rejection. Um, yeah, my students are shaking their heads uh, <laughs> because they see it. Um, I come in and, you know, lay my biases out on the table. Like, this is not a Western art history class. This isn't a Western class, whatever it is I teach. And that I will always privilege and center indigeneity. So in my indigenous women's class, um, they really are the center of everything. And so it is to undo knowing that you've learned over time about what indigenous womanhood looks like. Um, and I think it was initially slated to be taught about 
traditional womanhood. Mm -hmm. And that is not my bag at all. And so um, I teach about contemporary and historical figures, but women not as exceptionalist people like this, this, this pedestal, this pedestal person who you can't attain to be, but people that have worked hard and achieved um, something that's that is quite radical for their community and um, inspiring for you know the, the women in my classroom because it is something that you can attain in your lifetime and that people are doing it. These acts of attaining uh, positions within indigenous society that then bleeds into white society, Western, um, is very radical when we show up in places that we were never supposed to be. And, um, you know, I think about the Cholitas in Bolivia and mm -hmm. the places and things that they've done and they're phenomenal and very inspiring. And even when they become wrestlers, right? Um, the Luchidora, and I love them. And so my, my students get to see the expansive ways in which women, indigenous women can be very radical in like very local community settings um, that when the world turns in and looks to see what this, this indigenous womanhood looks like, um, it is something that we weren't, as Sean has said, you know, things we weren't supposed to be doing, you know, defying to be no one. Um, these women are defying that definition in many ways. And it is a result of, um, of refusal refusal to be labeled, refusal to be uh, pigeonholed and stuck in a place that they can only reside in. And quite often, I feel like there is an under understanding of uh, indigenous women and the, the, the position and place that we've held within our cultures because it's been so westernized. And, um, and so it's this unlearning and unpicking and unlearning and unlearning and learning the truth about the images that we're forced to see from childhood upward, Pocahontas, for example, and to learn the truth of what that of what her life actually was. And so I'm doing and unpacking and undoing and continuing to like tell you, you are at the center. You know, you are at the center. You are always at the center for me. And um, and that's why I hold space. And so, but to do that as well for artists, indigenous artists is, um, is an incredibly privileged and special place, not privileged in the way that I think settlers think of, but in the way that, you know, to have an indigenous voice speak about your art in ways that are um, generative and loving and uh, transformative is, um, I think it's a privilege for me, but I think it's, you know, it's just an honor yeah. and it's very radical. Yeah. I do you want to say something? Uh, oh, and, and you? Oh, well, I was going to, I'm going to just kind of tee off on something real quick because you mentioned it, you kind of brought it into the space. And I think there is, so I have a, an issue with the way in which we've defined traditional <laughs> these days, right? Yes. Because I think a lot of the times when we say traditional, we're not unpacking a lot of the stuff that has been moved into that, um, I want to say image of tradition, right? I've always viewed tradition as something that carries us through generations, but that is flexible, right? And a lot of times it's become so, I think, static or cast in amber because of the ways in which we have, as indigenous people have tried to maintain our life ways in the face of colonization and this rigidity. But I'll, I'll give you a, a kind of a case in point on that. So, you know, there was a story that I heard from a community that essentially they had, um, you know, they would, there was a, a couple of, they were, a couple of the groups were separated by a snowstorm and it was during ceremony time, right? And the folks that were, they were message bringer folks and they were the ones that were separated out and they, they the ceremony still had to go on. So what did they do? Well, phone lines had just been installed, right? And so they just picked up the phone and, and, and carried the message. They sang the songs through the phone line. Right to do that over here. Now we've gotten in this space today that I feel like we talk about tradition as like a rejection of Western society. That there is a traditional way of doing things, and there's the and then there's the the white man's way, the Western way of doing that. 
and creating this binary. But I know that our ancestors and our grandparents and everybody else, they were all about adaptation right. and survival. I was like, ceremony has to go on. Here's the phone. Just you, like sing it through here. Yeah, no, we'll see. You can't get down here, but the ceremony has to keep going. The sun has to keep, you know, moving. We have to sing it up. And and I thought that that's so when I, we talked about that, I think that there's an unpacking around for me, there's an unpacking still around the concept of tradition, especially in this modern age, um, especially with what y'all are growing up with. Right. Like this idea of what is traditional, what is not traditional, how are women's roles traditional? Right. Because that's a huge issue. I mean, how much of that is Western patriarchy right. overlaying on the idea of Native women's roles in the society? Well, you can't you can't actually hold a leadership position uh, because you have your <laughs> own you have your own little groups and you all make decisions, except the really important decisions. You can't make those decisions. We can only make those decisions. And we've seen this. I've, I've talked to a lot of Native women. What's been actually really exciting is to see the number of Native women now that are starting to become you know, leaders in their communities, chair people and you know, uh, chiefs and all the rest of that. Um, but that's, that's, you know, that's been a recent development. Um, Cause I even put out a little call for that. And I went through the list of tribal leadership and it was like, uh, there were a lot of women on that one. And then all of a sudden there was like just a whole bunch more and it was very exciting. So I think that's one thing that I, um, you know, I think that this idea of, of radical, radicality, if you will, um, is, you know, how we're also rethinking a lot of these things and unpacking the ways in which our identities, our concepts, our life ways have uh, been co-opted, right? And co-opted by, by an unseen hand. Um, and a lot of that, speaking to the students earlier, a lot of that having to revolve around pop culture. You know, who are we in these scenarios? Who are we when, you know, this group is, is who are we when I go into a school in South Texas or in, in Central Texas, um, and they don't know that natives exist at all. They've never seen that before. Who are we or who am I when I wear Pueblo style traditional dress and I'm told by a kid that's sitting in there because other folks are doing powwow dancing and they've got regalia and I'm wearing what I would wear traditionally at home and I'm told I'm not native, right? Well, you don't look native. Yeah. And that's, I think, part of that wrestling, right? And I think that's, I mean, all of my work kind of revolves around that. I was like, natives come in, we're, we're Baskin Robbins, baby. We're, you know, we come in all flavor, shapes and sizes. Right. That's the best part about it, because we have figured out all these. we have these familial connections up and down everywhere. So um, I don't know. What are you guys? What are y'all's thoughts about something like that? I don't know if I'm trying to be too controversial or whatever. Tonight. You're such a beautiful moderator, and I enjoy that. I'm um, just throwing it out. I'm just throwing it. Well, I, well, you're right. talking about things that are born, born out of pop culture. I know when uh, when I was five again, you know, when, else, when it all started, you know, when I knew the world wasn't, uh, you know, real nice. I was in kindergarten. And, uh, but this was a, wasn't, I mean, it, it's kind of bad, but um, one of the bad things that happened that year. But um, it, you know how when you're uh, kindergarten, I tell the story all the time, so, but I know you guys haven't heard it. Um, but, uh, but, uh, so it was towards, about now, and we were starting to rehearse for the annual uh, play that we have for, uh, you know, like you do the Christmas play and stuff like that. So uh, this that year's theme was things in American history. And so, of course, you know, they had to have Thanksgiving scene. And, uh, and guess what they wanted me to play because I was the only Indian there? The turkey. Yeah. No. Yeah, sorry. exactly. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I had to be, and they, they had this uh, um, fake fire and stuff and every, all these other, these non-Indian kids had to wear uh, turkey, you know, turkey feathers, the colorful ones. And I was supposed to wear it and do this. Yeah. And uh, boy, I was mad. And uh, because I must've already been taught uh, as a young guy uh, by my parents, how to be proud or, to be proud and all that and I knew it was bad and so I went home that day and I told my mom I wasn't going back to school again they wanted me to do this and so she politely she handled it you know professionally she called down to the school and told the teacher you know that this stereotypical and 
And my, my parents used to go around, my mom worked for that lo the local community college there in that town. And they used to put on and bring in uh, different elders from different reservations to talk about stereotypes and things like that in history, Indian history. And uh, my mom said, we just had a talk there. We told you about stuff, and don't you remember? And then the, and the teacher, you know, honestly said, well, I learned all this from the movies. And so I figured that's what it was. And so my mom had said, well, no, no. And, um, but long story short, um, I did go back to school and I didn't have to play in Indian, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to be typecasted. And, uh, just kidding. <laughs> but, and, uh, and uh, instead, but they still had to have that Thanksgiving scene. But instead I got to play, I had to be Uncle Sam, you know, the, the, <laughs> American that's flag. Extreme. Yeah. So, so I don't know if that joke was still on. And as a spit. Yeah. So you'll see that real. You'll see yeah. that imagery in my work too. And um, so, yeah, that's what I was thinking about when you said uh, stuff. That's, yeah. So, well, that's I, all that at, at five years old. And yep. there was other real negative racist, racism stuff, but that, which would be one of the first times I look back at one of the first times that I helped or played some part in trying to break down stereotypes mm -hmm. and that become a Indian studies teacher and artist to talk about it. I do find it just fascinating. I don't know if you had the, but how much like advocates a lot of our parents were. Cause I mean, we're, we're probably roughly the same age, I think for the three of us. And I was like, my parents, I was, we were, we were Nixon uh, Columbus day long before it got this momentum. My parents sent me to school when I was five years old with a black armband on October 19th for the day, right? Like that was the whole thing. And I think there was, there was a radicality and there was a radical nature of our parents that came out of like the fifties and sixties because they were much, they, the education, I mean, they, by hooker, they went to school, right? And they learned the systems and they came out. And even though some of the things had been lost, they came back, they were just like, no, my kid's not going to do this. My kid's not going to be a part of this you know, which is now passed down to us, right? Like, I was like, no, I told my teacher they were having to read some book, Thunder Rolling Down the Mountain by Scott O'Dell. Scott O'Dell also wrote a book called Island of the Blue Dolphin. They're Newbery Award winners, the big thing for like kids books. And they're really bad. And he's a non-native writer. And they still have this in our school systems. They're still teaching Scott O'Dell because that's all that they can find. It's part of the canon. And and so I, you know, and it's it's about the Nez Perce and Chief Joseph and how Chief Joseph's daughter wants to be a warrior, but is told she can't be a warrior because she has home duties. And, you know, it's the whole thing, right? So not only is it like racist, it's also sexist simultaneously. Like, they, man, I was like, man, you tied that up in a nice little bow, didn't you, right? But she finds her way eventually to, you know, be a leader of her tribe, right? And it's a whole thing. I went and told my te the teacher that was teaching, I was like, he's not going to read this. Because I got a 12-year-old. I was like, I'll have him read somebody else. Why don't I have him read um, How I Became a Ghost by Tim Tingle, right? That talks yeah. about the yes. long walk. Uh, it's a YA book. It's fantastic. And it's written by a Native person. Because there's many more options at this point. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I was like, I don't know. Maybe did you have, were you, did you have advocate radical parents as well? Or I'm sorry, aunties. I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> sorry, don't mean to throw you under the bus. Didn't throw you under the bus. Let's say I, aunties or or guardians, folks that were helping out in that space. Well, my 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 life has been a lot more diasporic, you know, because I'm I'm a military. Right. Guy. So, so there have been as much advocating on that because it was done this way, right? My mother, my mother and father were both in the military. Okay. And so, within the military communities, there are things that you just can't right. get involved in, and. And it didn't occur to me that, you know, that some of that, that stuff was so normalized, not that, not all this stuff, um, <laughs> but um, the uh, stand up, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Pledge of Allegiance, the national anthem before every movie uh, came on, just, um, you know, the American flag everywhere. Mm -hmm. And very, 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 well, I actually didn't learn anything about my indigenous community from any place in school. Like that never happened. And so it all came from things. I remember long drives to my parents, uh, my grandparents and my mom and dad telling stories and talking in the dark on that long drive from Lawton to Jay to Northeastern Oklahoma. And um, 
and being with my grandma. So in the middle of in transferring from one place to the other, I spent several summers with my grandma. And so that's where I learned um, what it really meant for me to be a Cherokee woman. And so I am a gardener. I'm an agriculturalist, like big time. Um, I, I'm not saying I'm great at it, but <laughs> I do it. And, you know, just a lot of other things that I would be so hard to put my finger on, but, um, you know, just the things that we did, uh, the way that community functioned around me when I was home. And I got a sense of home. Like that was the most grounding thing for me was being able to know where home was as a military child. And that was, you know, in this little tiny house in, in the middle of the woods in Oklahoma. And uh, it continued to be, it continues to be. And um, however, that sort of advocacy didn't, you know, didn't fall away from me. I have done that for my children a lot. And we've talked about, you know, the things that they won't do or participate in school. And, you know, so right. Oklahoma is still terrible for these kinds of misrepresentation, which is mm -hmm. sort of amazing. And every year there is some kind of fight that goes on, which is necessary. And so, um, but yeah, I'm a, I am and continue to always be a really big advocate, not just for my children, but I've had to do it throughout my whole college education. Sure. Where I've stood up and said, nope, not while I'm in this classroom. You know, where there are several academics who are playing Indian that we will not read while I'm in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're not going to seek an option. We're just not doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to fill that space with something else, go for it. But we're not seeking somebody just as problematic to take that space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, under the guise of, but it's the indigenous voice. Well, no, it isn't because they're not accepted by community or they're not recognized. And so, which becomes a really interesting mm -hmm. and divisive conversation to have. So, yeah. yeah. I just want to point something out real quick that I always find fascinating. So my dissertation was on uh, like education, Indian education, and uh, but really focusing on leadership and how leadership develops and where young people learn. And both of you just within this span of like this, whatever, 50 minutes that we've been here, both talked about grandparents yeah. and the learning from grand. And that was actually what my dissertation findings also had as well was so much learning was like, I was like, what are you learning in school? And they were like, all, like across the board, it's like, not much, you know? But it was like, so where did you learn? It was like a lot from my grandparents. Yeah. Like, and that was for me too. Like I spent all, I even said it at the beginning, I mentioned as well, spending the summers with my grandma and my grandparents and being out in community and just being there, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's, I think that part of, because I think my grandma was probably one of the smartest people I ever knew. You know, I found years later, she had written, down like she had copied poems in this notebook after she passed it was in my dad's stuff like from you know like Nikki Giovanni and Walt Whitman and like all these poets that she loved right and all these folks in there and I was like Man, my grandma was awesome <laughs> I didn't even know that she was just the lady that made me eggs every morning and little toad, toad in the hole I don't remember what we called it but she made a little egg in the toast I love that right so I just, you know, I think, and but I think so much of that reminding of home, and I will say, not that we're tying everything to it, but I think that is, there's a, there was a, a that was a radical generation, you know, yeah. of, of those, those folks that were coming out of, you know, out of two world wars and a depression and boarding school. I mean, boarding school was still kicking until the 1950s, really, like in the old systems. So I don't know. I just find that really fascinating. Anyway, I just want to point that out. So yeah, I think my my dad was really influenced by his grandparents, you know, to be to be that to do what he does, not just from his grandma, the art Indian art side, and then his grandpa, you know, to be with that Maani philosophy of becoming generous, especially generous. Yeah. And um, and my mom as well. Um, one thing I wanted to say too, um, uh, uh, well, when you say grandparents, so I, I still have my parents, but I came along, my brother and sister were born about 10 years before I was, kind of about when Paul was born. <laughs> hey, hey, yo. But uh, rough crowd, man, rough crowd. But seriously, uh, <laughs> but yeah, they were. This is their relationship. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 10 years before uh, that I came along in 1971, and uh, I was, I think I was an accident, but 
but uh but they were my parents and then all of a sudden they felt like my grandparents because they were getting up there it was about when i was 11 or 12 it felt like my grandparents and i and because i was the youngest i was i went all over with them most more when they would visit uh elders or old people in different tribes and different places and so and being quiet they all liked me because i just sat still and didn't do anything <laughs> So yeah, so I picked up a lot on that. And then when you're talking about parent being radical, uh, I look back and um, you know, I see my dad is teaching, teaching me things to be myself. You might think, you know, because he's the male, he's the more radical one. It was actually my mom who was a lot more professional, and, you know, you know, in that sense. Because when I was about five. Uh, we used to go to the uh, col the community colleges basketball games all the time. And you brought up the the uh, national anthem, and so so she these were her directions. She said, "Don't uh, or when you when they do the national anthem at the games, stand up and and uh, be respectful. But you'll see everybody put their hand on their heart. Don't put your hand on your heart because that symbolizes freedom." And Indian people are not free. So don't do that, but still be respectful because this still is our land, our Indian land. And that, and you could think of that flag representing that. And so looking back, she's probably the one. And then later, fast forward, you see my work and she's the one telling me, oh, you should be more positive. Why are you so negative? <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it. It's <laughs> yeah, I think that um, with conversations of grandparents and things that we've learned, it takes us to something we were talking about kind of on the periphery earlier, um, which is um, sort of about place-based, right, mm -hmm. knowledge, you know, right. grand, to have your grandparents with you is generally about place, but then, you know, there's other ways in which um, place gets evoked, and so for my work, it's um you know, looking at things as place-based art and production as opposed to that word traditional, right? Because um, it displaces that sort of, what I tell my students, that black and white picture of the things that we do as indigenous people, um, which keeps us sort of relegated to the past and how uh, that, that one college has all those sepia posters in that one hallway. And it's all like, romantic and feathers and beads and leather and you know and this like this longing and looking off um and this sense of disappearance right we're disappearing and um all my students will tell you that i tell them you know we are going to stop looking at indigenous people as if they are black and white relics um because that doesn't allow you to see us you see us in color you will see us in the color of the paintings that we see you will see us as full human beings, complex, living, and in your presence. You know, even the people that we see that are downtown that are, you know, part of the homeless and addicted and, you know, other things community, that they are to humans and you will see them as humans. That's the goal of my classes. I will help humanize you and make you better people. And, um, but that requires you to see us in different ways. And it does displace the sense of, tradition, you know, where you can use that word in a way that it should be used um, in terms of practice as a, a in terms, and instead of like replacing it for everything else that is indigenous, it's traditional. What do you think? We're gonna, we're, we're doing something that like relegates us to the past instead of we are continuing and continuing to do place-based art or art about our place. Um, our home, our homelands, and the situation that we're in. But as Sean does, to continue to put um, historical context in there, um, humor from his life, and um, and all kinds of other things, the dark and sadness. No, just kidding. Um, there, <laughs> there is humor in there, and there's you know there is a little bit of our gallows and in humor kind of thing, that thing that we do uh, that keeps us sane. But then there is also just straight up humor. And so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I sort of drifted off. No, it's okay, because I think place, I mean, I think it's important to recognize place and how we keep rethinking 
those concepts of yeah. things, right? So what does it mean to be from a place and to move away from that place? Yeah. And then reset this idea of territory and diaspora, yes. right? So in, you know, especially around forced removal, yeah. and then how do you reestablish that home? And I think this ties into a lot, you know, if we want to talk like some nerd stuff is what happens if, you know, are you, if you go off planet, are you still indigenous? I love that. It's a question I continue to ask. If we were to say go to and live on Mars, like this whole group of, you know, like just native kids everywhere, right? We all just go live on Mars. Are you still indigenous anymore? Because that's essentially what happened with a lot of groups, right? And we still consider ourselves because we carry these traditions. So, so then what makes it the traditional space, right? So if you think about any of the stuff that happened in Southeast removal, yeah. To hold homeland is over here. And by, in some aspects, it would be thousands of miles away. And, you know, it, if, if we're thinking about that, you know, that would, that's the distance to the moon back then yeah. when you have to walk. So like, what is that now? And I always, that always catches me, right? That, so um, this, we have, we have a question or a comment. I want to jump in with that before I don't want to leave you out. So yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Oh wait, gonna, are we allowed to use it now? Is it the yeah, break yeah, time? Perfect. Yeah. I was just gonna uh, lead off just before we get- Okay, hold on one second. Audience. I have one quick question. Okay. Um, it's for the three of you. Um, I've taken an anthropology class in indigeneity. So the term indigeneity, how do you define that term? Oh, that's ephemeral, goodness. <laughs> and I use it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Context. I use it in context. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's. I really want to say it somewhere. It revolves around ways of being and knowing. Um, it is for me. It's it's connected back through story to to ancestors. Um, I think it has to do with an understanding of place. Yeah. I think it has to do with an understanding of the brilliance always for me, the brilliance of indigenous peoples that we, uh, you know, that, that, that pop culture has really put on us this idea of primitivism, but we were creating earthworks and cities and, you know, thousands of years ago. So I think that like all of this is incorporated in my mind of a concept of indigeneity. Like that all means, you know, like how you act and behave and talk and all the things, the dark and the light, right? Like everything in between, you know, sometimes it's it's sorrowful, sometimes it's joyful and, and all of that comes together. I think that's the best way I can get around it. I'm not, I don't know if I have like a, a pinpoint definition for it for myself. And it's never linear, right? It's all, I mean, it, it just isn't in the way that we think. Um, I think that colonial history teaches and settler history teaches to get from one point to another point to another point to another point. If we're talking about this, you know, we're always, you know, calling forth our ancestors. Why are we doing this presently? You know, bringing our ancestors with us wherever we're going and whatever we're doing, but also because we're trying to build a future. And so these things are not linear at all. And, um, but for me, it does center indigeneity. I mean, using the word and the word, it centers indigenous. Um, lives wherever those lives are whether they're now they were in the past and in the present that is what it does indigeneity does so much work but what it does make you do is stop because if you're not used to hearing that word all the time you do have to stop and consider well what are you talking about you keep throwing this word at me because you know as i told you in a conversation earlier you know for me, indigeneity is here. It's always here. I'm always in the center. I'm not fighting anybody for space. I'm taking it up because we are at the center. And, you know, it is everybody else's understanding and perspective that is skewed <laughs> to think that they're at the middle. Don't do that. Um, not to me. We're in the center. We're always in the center. And so indigeneity just keeps reinforcing this space and this centering. And so it doesn't matter how often he uses it, just keep thinking space, you know, yeah. holding space, taking yeah. up space. So well, I'll give you part that uh, part of it, I, I think. Uh, you know, part of it's being able to define yourself as an indigenous person. 
and doing, you know, just doing what you want. That's how you feel. But the main part of it for me, I think, is uh, the philosophy that my great grandfather, who was the first in my line to go through um, the Indian boarding school system back in the 1880s, 1870s, and um, on our reservation. And he talked about to his grandson, who happened to be my dad, uh, about being prosperous and generous. So I took that and we talked about it. And that's a, an Ani philosophy. That's an old philosophy to be prosperous, to make something of yourself, to, you know, what, whatever world or whatever your surroundings were that you were in. My dad uh, or my great grandpa just had wasn't able to be successful as a, an old, old time Indian, you know, uh, gaining war honors on a battlefield or stealing horses or be doing those acts of bravery, but he still did things. And then my dad did that with his um, success in the Xerox Corporation. And at the same time, he he uh, was successful. You know, he's still indigenous, still doing, you know, the practices. But with whatever he got or acquired, he was generous with all of that, you know, with, with different people. And, uh, and uh, so I think that's, for me, that's part of it. Awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, before um, Shane there uh, asked, for me, I think that it's really important that we don't put too much weight on the word. So indigenous is just another concept that we're just going to really explore and understand. And for me to be indigenous is when you take a look and it goes back to philosophy, who, who am I, where do I come from? The basic question. And when you understand that, and that's what our elders teach us, we've got two sets of elders. We have our elders that are biological, but then they can be an extension because we're still trying to be home. Therefore, our clans are not So within that, then I can't speak for any other tribal groups, but if it's the Confederacy, the lack of Confederacy, we had, a, we continue to have a very sophisticated education system, even though the institutions are somewhat disrupted. So the second set of elders are those that have gone through the teachings right from, that means they've gone through all of the teachings which are provided by our societies. And if you really begin to take a look at them, this is when, they start at nursery, they go into kindergarten, however you see the system. The Western system that we see now as an educational system is not new, at least to the lot of people. That's our system. So when you transfer into these societies four years, you're going to be in preschool. Four years, you're going to be in practical kindergarten. Four years you're going to go from one to three. So all of these are right up until you earn your doctorates. And those are the second set of elders that will teach, are the main teachers of all these various education groups. So that's our system. Now, it's reinforced to our biological those teachings because in those societies that they're being taught is philosophy, geography, math, biology, physics. We were gifted with physics. We know that really well. Um, I can go on. The role of women, role of men. Well, how did what was our institution? And so all of those are taught in a very formal manner. 
And that's the way that. So indigenous, and what's being taught in those is a belief system that shapes an individual's worldview. So when I go to Mars and they drop me off over there, and I'm looking around, my indigenous no, I'm fine. I'm blackfoot. I'm sedate, that guy. I'm a blackfoot woman. And I come to you because of respect, because I've been taught that. Truth is that you try and practice all this. And every society comes from a root, comes from tribes. And we're all here now in the 20th century, 21st, whatever they call it. And we adapt. So it's not about tradition, about how you start that fire or how you cut that tobacco, how you make that dress and how you dance. Am I the only person that the creator and the gods and everybody else put us here for is am I going to come to the universe? I can respect not only my fellow human beings, I will respect every single drop of water. I will respect the land, everything that's in it. Now that's to me when you understand the future. So I may have to start over in Mars to you know, pack my seeds. That's what to me is, and I think that's what really, and I've been in the education system since I was 19, and it began here, but I was also in the city. So to me, radically educated or is when you're sitting in a trailer and it's 28 below outside and the winds are howling, Pine Ridge Village. The leaky trailer, and you're putting together tribal control. Okay? That's radical, and we're continuing to do so. So let's not get it caught up in the, you know, definitions. It's an understanding of who am I, where do I come from. We don't all come from the same place. I know where you come from. I've been in your country. I have people that are related to you. And so and as we go, that's what we do is try to respect each and every So to me, that I think is the most important part, especially with all these new definitions. You know, I started off as Indian, not an original, first nation. Um, now it looks like so, I, you know, I can expect those terms, but, but also I think there's a caution here is that it clumps us all together, takes away that identity of the black where she comes from, her tribe, how they do. So we shouldn't be clumping each other, and that's what to me. Is I see what the indigenous classes or the indigenous are. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know the the radical those that were the trailblazers of the tribal colleges. You know they knew that we had to adapt and live in today's world. That's one of the things my dad really taught me. Um, as he started doing things to get criticized, well, that's not traditional or that's, you know, he would flip it back around and say, well, why are you wearing, where's your traditional attire? You're wearing tennis shoes, you know, in this. And so, yeah, I think, I think the tribal college movement is the definition of all that as, the, as you brought it up. And we're so young and we have, uh, we're struggling, we're always struggling for funding, and, but the amazing things that we've created with the foundation of our Aani uh, language and culture, our Nakoda language and culture, it uh, speaks louder than anything. 
And I think it's, I think it's also important to, rem I mean, as we talk about this is where you are. And then also, I think part of that responsibility that I know that we have around this radicality, this radical nature is to also remember those folks that, I mean, we're carrying these ancestors with us, right? So you're thinking of like, you know, Jack Forbes and Susan Faircloth and, you know, these folks that were instrumental in the tribal college movement. And then, and then the folks that we have locally, I don't know those stories, but like, who were those folks that were in those first conversations within the communities to be able to move, you know, from a, a BIA system to a tribally controlled system? Because there's only what the, I mean, out of the, you know, a hundred or so that were that were around school systems, right? Not just the tribal the tribal colleges, but of school systems, there's just a handful left now, right? Because our own communities have been being like, no, we're gonna we're gonna this is we're gonna we got this, we got this now, you know. And indigeneity or indigenous in, in does a lot of work. And the one thing that it doesn't do is replace anybody's tribal specificity. Like we do know who we are as individual tribal members. Um, and that's always important. But I think um, one of the things that it acknowledges is um, it acknowledges uh, the diaspora. And I think that's really important because we all can't be home in our community is learning the things that we need to learn from the people that we need to learn them from. It's not always possible to go home for many people. And that's just a reality of the things that have happened to us as indigenous people. If you are blessed to be intact and on what you call your traditional homeland now, because for my people, we've moved. Um, and so we are, some, some of us are still on our, by our motherland and we are, we are removed from that. But um, indigenous in my classroom does the work of saying, you know, we are not alone in the struggles that we have that indigenous people all over the globe, that global indigeneity, um, have, have gone through similar struggles and um, there are ways of working through this and we don't always have to reinvent the wheel that we can help each other understand what it is to suffer, um, but also understand what it is to succeed. And so it doesn't always have to be a, a story that um, stays in this trauma trope, right? Mm -hmm. That we, we can succeed in similar ways. And I find that to be incredibly important and very compelling. And so, but it does never, I mean, it does, it doesn't ever do the work of replacing who we are and who we know we are. Um, but it does a lot of other work that I find is really important um, to many people. And as a person who knows my community, but is also um, diasporic um, because I was a military child and not, not raised at home, um, I am fortunate to know home and to have been home. And so, whereas a lot of people can't do that. Mm -hmm. And we know the realities of the you know the 20th century um, that has made that even more difficult. Um, and so, but Bernard, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Well, not really that question, but I noticed that, I noticed that all three of the, all three of the three of the groups, one is in our, in, 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 uh, on the books and poster, and the other is in uh, distance. Art again, and all three of your all three of your um, films are basically not the same thing. The pictures fall in the river. Yeah, get out of the ground and then in the No, I think I think you're absolutely uh, yeah. right. It worked towards the same in the same direction. Yes, and uh, also also I'm a photographer, which in black. I'm happy I can say that. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that I was raised to be black. I'm a, I'm a very strong cultured black because I was I'm raised with my language. I'm raised with knowing it. I'm, I'm raised with understanding it. Also, I'm also, also very happy that I'm disconnected about knowing that my grandmother, very great grandmother, can speak to it. That is fortunate. 
brilliant and I don't want to dismiss that, but I did want to get back real quick because something came up while you were talking, this idea of indigenous and indigeneity. And again, we also have to reconcile that they it's still a Western term, right? Like we have our own home terms for who we are, where we come from. We, you know, um, but if we use that Western terminology, and it just struck me is that indigenous is an adjective, right? So it's an it's an inherent adjective, it's an indigenous person. Indigeneity is is a noun. It is, it is a thing. It is, it takes on something tangible. So it moves from being a descriptor in a Western term to being an uh, you know, to being a thing, right. an object, indigeneity. You are practicing indigeneity. This is this is a this is a moment. So uh, you know that I think there's something to that. Again, back to my answer is like I don't have an answer, but I have things that are all swirling around. And I think there's something around the ways in which we use these terminologies for ourselves. In the ways in which we're adapting these things. I mean, I, I think that it's, you know, a lot of folks, is it, I mean, for me, is it Native American? Are we still, is it American Indian? Is it Indian? Is it indigenous? Is it First Nations? Is it Aboriginal? There's a lot of terms, and some of them were very hard fought in the, to, in the, yeah. in the times that they came around. American Indian was very hard fought for because people were trying to change from Indian or Indian, right? There's a slur. These types of terminologies that were used around folks. So, but I think Vine Deloria talks about it in, the, in terms of indig indigenous and the use is that it's whatever we are as, a, as, as peoples here that have held our culture and faced uh, and, and survived through the colonial apocalypse as if we're in the walking dead, yeah. right? We're still here, right? Um, is, is that it's, it is constantly evolving. And that is one of the, the, the hallmarks or benchmarks of indigeneity. Is is adaptation um, and evolution that we we are in a state of adaptation, kind of because we have to be, but we can trace back through our storylines that we were always kind of this way, um, that we had this, and that and that we can pull from our story archaeology of all these you know these stories that have been handed down. Folks are always kind of learning. We were we were charting the skies before people understood how to do that. We were carving the stone stories, right? We were carving on that, on, we were carrying this and creating, you know, uh, uh, symbology, memes, lesson plan, like all this kind of stuff that, that stone stories are. I've done a lot of, of, of stonework. And these were things that we used to teach back in the day. I remember, so we were studying um, petroglyphs in Azerbaijan. The petroglyphs are about 10,000 years old. And the Azerbaijani folks are so sort of cosmopolitanly colonized by the Romans, by the Russians, by the, you know, by the, the all the people that kind of went around the sea into that space, that they are very disconnected from their, their traditional and cultural heritage. And the young people that we talk to, you know, are this, are this mix of everything. They're this myriad. And so a lot of our work as Pueblo folks is like, we can still point to our traditional grounds. That's we know what those carvings are. We know what these means because we have stories that align with them. So we're trying to get them to reconnect back. But one of the one of the things is is there was um, you know, they they codify. I mean, like for a lot of the petroglyphs, we've codified too. If you think about the intelligence of of indigenous people of native peoples, so we've codified meaning around something. So they had taken what I think it was an auroch, right? And carved it. It's huge. It's probably about the size of this chalkboard right here, right? Even bigger. And everyone was sitting there debating, what could this possibly mean? Oh, it was probably something religious and symbolic because it held deep meaning. And the first thing I thought when I saw it as a teacher, I was like, no, this is how you teach kids to hit a target. This thing is huge. They're going to throw a spear or they're going to throw a rock or they're going to know what it looks like. This is what you would do. And it also may have ceremonial meaning. It may have other things involved. But I was like, no, this is a chalkboard, y'all. Like... <laughs> And it's, and it's a long run, you can't ever erase it because that's going to be the thing. You're going to teach it down the line. So that education purpose, mm -hmm. I think, has been inherent that we have been doing for since time immemorial. We've been teaching in these ways time and time again. So I don't know. I think there's something around indigeneity with that. I had the privilege of being with Jolene Ricard and talking about something I'm working on now um, to do with Cherokee pottery. And you know, we were talking, I said, you know, for a pot that I'm looking at to be seven from, from the year 700, um, it was highly fired and it was spin walled. And so for something like that to have survived 
in any form of being intact um, required knowledge. Calculus. And it required, um, it required an understanding of things that you need to add to certain kinds of earth to make them be able to withstand high firing because all pots can't do that. And, um, and those things, you know, whether it's you know, granite, whether it's, you know, dust from the fire, whatever it is, you know, that is, that is knowledge. It becomes knowledge transmission. It is memory um, transit transmission as well. But it's also, you know, I was talking to uh, Dr. Ricard and she said, it's the scientific method, which is indigenous. We have always known how to do this. Um, we are technologically and scientifically minded people. And um, so for wherever our people were, they were creating and they were testing and they were, you know, they were failing and they were coming back and trying again and finding out what worked and understanding what didn't work. And so um, it, it is, it is along these lines of um, knowledge. Um, yeah, we, we've done this. We've been doing this since time immemorial. <laughs> Always like to say, yeah. So we have some questions from the web webinar. Oh, sweet. Um, What's up, y'all? How's it going? <laughs> Shadow stranger. <laughs> yeah, what's up? He's asking, or she, how do you feel about redrawing and renaming provincial borders to reflect indigenous land and people? And how can we begin this process? Well, uh, since you tapped me. <laughs> you. Well, you know, this, I think um, I'll do an example from where I'm from. You know, I think names are power, powerful and there are stories behind all the names of our, uh, our landmarks, our geography and all of that. But even in our educational system, um, where I'm at, it's called, the reservation is called Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. Mm -hmm. And Belknap, William Belknap, it was named after he was a secretary of war under Ulysses S. Grant in the 1860s in the United States. And uh, for some reason, they named it after him and he was, he embezzled, he, he was impeached as secretary of war. And one of the guys that testified against him was Custer, I guess. Of all people, but anyway, side note. Well, but uh, some reason they named that res our reservation after him, and he never did go there, and so that's what we are. So now we, so well, I'm Belknap, I'm Fort Belknap, but that doesn't really mean anything, you know. It's Ani or Nakoda or you know, whatever your tribal language name is. So when our college was born, 1983. They uh, called it Fort Belknap College just for the lack of, maybe they, I don't know, I don't want to say anything. Maybe there wasn't that mindset back then, but the Tribal College was born in Fort Belknap College. Uh, and it wasn't until 2011, the leadership, and I was there, and my mom was the president at the time, the leadership said, let's change this name to reflect who and what this college is, is about. And that's the uh, Ani and the Nakoda people. And then that's what it is. I, I mean, it, for the first part of the question, what do I think about? I think the renamings are absolutely important. Our, our Spanish name for our community is San Jose de la Laguna. We founded in 1890, 1891. Um, and especially for mission uh, like Pueblos and our coastal California relatives, um, we were founded with a church. So the Catholic Church has created the establishment and, and was the name that was given to our, almost like our baptismal name um, for our own communities. It's not what we call ourselves. We are Kawake, uh, our, our, you know, our closest relatives down the road, um, which is known as Akama Pueblo. It's Aku so, or Akume, which is what they call themselves. So a lot of these name, these namings, I think, is one of the first starts. I think I've got, in terms of at least namings and borders, um, you know, I think I think the first thing is is continuing to remember our own traditional names, and then for the border work, border work is really around cartography. 
And we've got some amazing native cartographers out there. Laura Harjo at, I think she's at Oklahoma now, um, you know, is fantastic, you know, doing cart cartographic work. And I think it's how do we reorient and you tribalography? How do we center ourselves in the mapping? So I don't know what the provincial borders are going to do. They, they ain't going to let go nothing, right? But if we start changing the perceptions, if we get into pop culture and we redraw these things, think about the maps that you do at your school, right? Like you send in the school, instead of seeing the USA map with our little tiny things that are surrounded, why don't we make just the map of our space? And out there is, you know, other stuff. But this is our world right here. This is our traditional space. That's the maps that we put up on the world. It's the same thing as when you see, you know, what it flips everybody's lid to think how uh, how big certain spaces are, but the Mercator map centered Europe and America, right? And North America in, in the way that maps were designed. And then you go to a place like Australia and realize that it is just as large as the United States, if not larger, except on the map, where's Australia at? It's all the way down in the corner. It's so teeny tiny over there in the corner. And there's a, you know, America, North America. Yeah, it's right up here, right in your face, always in the center. And that's not actually how they position themselves. So I think mapping is hugely important in, but we have to take control of those map, that mapping. That's the first step. Like we have to rename the stuff and recontrol that mapping for ourselves because that's how then we create a visual iconography for, for it. It's the, it's, there's no, there is no petroglyph here, but I'm going to keep pointing <laughs> to it like there is. Um, it's the, you know, it's the petroglyphs. It's that we are codifying our own identity um, in these spaces. So that's for me. I don't know. Do you got anything there? Yeah, I think you all you said it all. Maps work. All right, who else? Uh, yeah, what else? Do we have I'd like to add to that that it's extremely important that we're educating ourselves about the history of the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's a part of truth and reconciliation. And for those treaties that have not been fully addressed, legal and political, is that. The Gitsan Wet'suwet'en land claims case, that's what it was all about, too. They had to establish their territory. And as a result of that, we were able to establish that that was their traditional territory. And it was only through their names of the mountains, the boundaries, the rivers, and eventually the, uh, um, the hearsay. Because then they took into consideration in order to validate and confirm, they had to rely on the stories or what was considered legends or a category. But that was a landmark that establishes the importance of naming the boundaries, establishing the territories. And it's a very dilute version when you do the uh, the acknowledgement of the mass, it's even mass getting convoluted. Mm -hmm. So, for the same, whoever asked that question, at least I feel strongly in Canada that it was very important that that would be done. Okay. Are there any other online questions? Yeah, there's, there's another online question from Megan Rennie. Um, She's asking just a general question about the panelists' experiences. Um, what kind of differences they have seen in the work being done um, in the context of uh, Canadian versus American, in the context of different Indigenous communities? I'm having you. No tapping, it, you know, in my field, it feels different. Um, I had a really good conversation with some uh, Canadian Indigenous scholars, art, art historians, curators this weekend. And, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to know that you're one of a handful of people that do Indigenous art history or actually teach it. Um, you know, they didn't actually mean like that, but there aren't that many of us. And so when I was talking about resources and things like that, you know, 
and especially open source, because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, there are very few. And so you're sort of picking and pulling from different areas where people have contributed thought on Canadian Indigenous art history. Um, and, you know, things that are just happening since 1960, right, in that area. Um, in the States, it's really changed. And it's become, I think, um, there are more of people doing what I do, that we have more uh, representation within the museums. And so, you know, they attribute that directly to like um, the quincentennial um, and the reaction that indigenous artists had to, to this, this moment when, um, you know, since, since these celebrations that happened differently in settler society and indigenous people are saying, we're here, we need to change things. We need to make this a moment of shifting. And what did happen were um, funding opportunities happened. Uh, more indigenous people went through the university and more indigenous people came into the museum spaces. Um, more indigenous people, tribal communities um, created their own museums out of necessity because of NAGPRA, right? Mm -hmm. They had to do act proactive things to get their, um, to get objects and relatives home. Um, so it's it's really different. It is a very different space um, between them and here. But you know we're we're a bit younger up here in those in in those sort of institutional representations, and so we're making great progress very fast. Because I would say that there may be a few, but they're very mighty, and um, and they have accomplices from the other side of the border that are coming up and making sure that um, indigenous artists are being. Um, seen and represented and, um, you know, the things that have changed within the, like the National Gallery and the opening of other places. And so it's really important that, you know, that's my area. And so those are, those are the things that I see, I'm reading, that I'm teaching uh, my students about and um, to know that, you know, it is shifting. There is a shift, um, but that shift happened differently in a while ago in the States. And so we are catching up and we're doing it quickly, I think. And so there is room to be hopeful, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that matters. Sean. Oh, yeah, that's good. You can, I answered it. So that's art. Pop culture wise, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of shared similarities. I think that that there is um, a little bit more of a dedication in terms of the funding that comes into First Nations communities around media. So I can definitely say that there is much more programming uh, that's currently available up here. There are not a whole lot more comic books with you know native-centric comic books that exist right now, but it's a little bit ahead um, up here in, in so-called Canada. So I think that you know um, as that that shifting though is starting to happen within sort of the mass populace in America around you know sort of like native folks getting more television shows in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, Main Street, where they're actually putting money behind that. So you have Rutherford Falls, you have Reservation Dogs, you have uh, Spirit Rangers that just came out, right, uh, on Netflix. You have, what else am I thinking of? Um, uh, uh, Dark Winds. Dark Winds. Um, you have Prey, that was like Hulu's best, you know, watch, most watched show ever with, you know, with a, an, an indigenous cast, you know, up to that point, right? Um, so I think the, the change is happening. I think there's a lot of, interconnections between, you know, our communities, right? So like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks that are, you know, uh, First Nations folks that are working in, in Hollywood, um, you know, and getting a lot of gigs. There's a lot of work that's being done here within the studios north of the border. And then there's all these little studios that are starting to pop up. So from the film and television media side, Native folks are creating their own little studios um, in their in their spaces to be able to do filming uh, and to be able to create games or create content. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, just in terms of lit, lit, I think it's, you know, really kind of neck and neck, but I think it, you know, there's a lot of interconnection. The only thing that always stops is these artificial borders. It's very difficult to get media outside of digital media, get did, to get media back and forth across the border. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a limitation in terms of printing that can be done uh, because it's, it's, it's in some ways cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, I'm like, I, we, people order from us. Um, you know, I know Paul Strad to order from us sometimes to get stuff up here and it is expensive you know it's 20 bucks to you know 20 25 dollars to get 
a $5 comic shipped. And I was just like, you can just download it. I'll give you free PDF copies, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like, I don't want people to pay unless, and we try to actually throw, you know, tell people we're just like, hey, we got an electronic copy because I'll get some orders. Sometimes we'll get orders from Germany or Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia. And it's like a $50, it's $50 worth of postage. And we're just kind of like for a $5 book. And we're like, do you really want this book? Because I got an electronic copy because otherwise it's going to be real expensive. Um, oftentimes when I've gone to Australia, I'll, I'll go old import, just bring an extra suitcase just to bring books yeah. back, right? And just check it through because there's no way to get that without so, like $50 worth of postage. Um, so I think, you know, that's prohibitive. Uh, you know, that border is really prohibitive in terms of the media, like uh, physical, tangible media work. But digital media is 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 some great interconnections and and some awesome work that's going on, at least in my field. So all my students, you hear that? Digital. Yeah. <laughs> or just head down south. Like, I mean, you can just drive across the border and we'll just we'll put it there on the corner. Like we'll just put it there right after the gate and you all can just go pick it up. It's all good. Box, yeah. That's right. I'll just put somebody right there. I'll just be like, hey, yo, we got we got comics, we got native comics. I have a question. <laughs> So um, we were having a conversation earlier about um, things that get canceled and things that don't get canceled and things that further um, sort of the, the more traumatic aspects of our histories, our at-large, bigger histories. Um, why do you think that is? You know, why why are we canceling things that are purely purely humorous in exchange for things that are yeah. still really um can be very sad um so oh, I'll go I'll go well Sean would be good I mean Sean go there too so we can both hear you what do you mean like uh well the context that we were talking about is Rutherford Falls. So Rutherford Falls was just canceled. Oh, that that kind of canceled. Not the can, not the online can. That the, I thought you meant like uh, like cancel, cancel culture. culture. No, no, no. Actual can like it, it, can this is no. I mean, I guess they're the same, but it's like this will no longer be funded or produced anymore. So we were talking about how Rutherford Falls was canceled, and you know, and in my mind, they, I mean, I thought it was a really great show. I thought it was really funny, but I feel that there's a conformity that happens around Native identity being very you know, doom and gloom. It's dead and dying natives, right? This is this is what has been, you know, perpetuated out throughout Western culture and American culture and American pop culture, right? It's you know, it's it's the it's the the native it's the native riding away into the sunset. It's dances with wolves, right? It's the end of the trail. We know that, like, oh, you may have lived for now, but we know what the end of the story is, and it's no, you know, and so you have a sitcom. Right? It's the first native sitcom, really, that mainstream native sitcom, because I know others have been produced, but it's the first mainstream native sitcom, um, you know, that gets a national push for it. And it's the first of this group, this new batch that's come out that gets canceled. Um, and my take is that it's because it's a it's all about native humor. It's all about celebration. Dark Winds is, you know, is tribal fight. You know, it's 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 a detective. It's a dead people on the res, right? You know, there is an aspect to that. It's very funny, but res dogs has an underpinning. And that's, I mean, it's written as a drama. It's a dramedy in some ways, right? Um, but it has an underpinning of that, uh, you know? And and so the, uh, Yellowstone, like where we find native folks, right? There's like these types of characters that it's like, it's, it's, it's they're really weighty in a way. And yet the one sitcom gets, gets pulled off the air and almost was pulled off after season one, right? So that's, I think, what we were talking about, about it canceled. Is. So I don't know from your take and what you're saying or from, you know, how that's playing out, but that's sort yeah. of, well, I don't you know. know. Um, I only think in terms of my art and how I've been uh, accepted into uh, the art world. I think when I, when I began, I was painting the same stuff talking about the same things uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm probably doing the gloom myself like it you know but uh i was painting the same issues you know the indian holocaust uh, you know the uh, 90 to 90 percent uh, population decline the buffalo annihilation um, and I, I don't think i was accepted you know early on in the late 90s and the early 2000s interesting and 
now and then maybe my stuff just looks more interesting i don't know or maybe the timing is right i just i don't know i keep thinking about that because i think well i was more or less doing the same thing <laughs> saying the same thing back then and i for the so-called the the venues that were the indian art venues they would say my work was too not indian enough you know it wasn't the stereotype or it was too uh negative or it was too uh whatever depression depressing and now i don't know is it that, well and is it that, so that's fascinating and i think is it something having to do maybe from your perspective of that there was a there's a particular level in that and i know a lot a lot of that old work a level of nostalgia right there's this this sort of veneer of mythology and now we're in this age it's a lot more real and yeah. and this this reconciliation that you know that your work is just kind of like nope i'm coming right at you with this i'm not giving you this you know this like the, the vanishing indian right, right. that like oh they're just trailing off to disappear into the sunset you're like no this is exactly what is happening this is so it's genocide and ethnocide and I think maybe now we're ready to recognize it. I don't know, from your perspective. Well, I don't know, too. Well, when I was just an artist back then, that's what I wanted to convey, you know, the, the real story, the real history of who Indian people, who I am, what, have I, what I've experienced. But I felt like it just wasn't reaching, you know, it wasn't accepted. So it wasn't reaching. So I said, well, I'm going to become, a, of all things, a teacher in Native Studies. And I did to break, to get the word more out there. So I was um, in Bozeman, Montana, and, and that's majority non indian community. And then I thought, well, I still want to be more in the trenches, and help get my language back and, and educate my own people in who Indian people really are, because a, a lot of us don't know who we are. So I moved back to my home reservation and worked at our tribal college to do that and now i'm coming back around oh i have this art lingo or this art language in my back pocket i'm gonna i'm gonna poke it out there now and see what it, see if it hits anybody and then it kind of is you know mm -hmm. kind of coming back what are you saying yeah i don't well you know and i don't when i look at sean's art i think okay there are there is definitely some apocalypse and post-apocalyptic things going on imagery. And, um, but I also see, you know, in the post-apocalypse, there is survival, you know, we are on mm -hmm. that, we are, but, and then I think back to some of the graphic novels that I've worked on as a scholar, on the scholarly end, um, you know, coming back from planet version, whatever, to 2.5 or whatever, and coming back down to the planet and like still consuming of our culture, partaking, finding that to be really important. And that does happen in his art, right? And there is no, there is no end to who we are as native people. Um, even in his work, we continue on, you know, in whatever form, um, in the graphic novels, you know, we still continue and the challenges are there. It doesn't matter that it's like 5 million years in the future and, and whatever planet we're living on, we are still partaking. We are still um, listening to our ancestors. We are still working for futures for our children. And we are still really deeply participating in our cultures. And it's, um, it is, that is very hopeful. It is very the opposite of end of the trail and, mm -hmm. you know, and this, this tragedy trope that we have to like see ourselves reflected in constantly in, um, in some of these things that we get, you know, get pushed towards us. Um, we can partake of the humor that is, you know, important to who we are, you know, in our tribes and um, those inside humors, those beautiful moments that are just made for us. And, you know, I see that in both of the works that, you know, that you do and the things that you put forward Thank into you. the world. And um, I think that, you know, that that has to reside within you that, um, you know, people are looking towards our future constantly and bringing our ancestors with us and thinking of you, all of you. 
um, in what they're doing. And I find that to be really beautiful. You know, also I want to add to that about the humor stuff. So you look at this, you know, it's a big face smiling, but a lot of my stuff is our masks. Yeah. They're um, hidden. They're hiding probably me or whoever, maybe hiding whatever you went through or whatever I went through and having that smile. I, you know, my dad was one who always, and he still does smile and joke around. And a lot of my work does revolve around my dad too, by the way. And, um, but, you know, there's those underlying things how um, he was more or less, he didn't know his dad. His dad left, he was a Chickasaw Indian from Oklahoma, came out to Fort Ballard, didn't know him, never, uh, he left before he was born. And then his mom didn't really uh, have him, didn't take care of him or didn't, kind of threw him away as they as they say so he was raised by his grandparents so I think a lot of that stuff may have um, you know you know affected him it probably did but he always had this happy face and I don't know if that you know is you know really defined at, at, at who he is but for me you know I, I tend to try to hide myself and you know there's a um, I put a lot of imagery of uh, toilets, and uh, I don't know if you saw the one. There's one back here, but and there's a guy on the toilet. He's got a war bonnet on too. Yeah, so sometimes they're in their um, regalia. Well, there's that symbol. The the symbolic thing of that is um, when my dad was going to boarding school in South Dakota, <clears throat> he would deliver newspapers to to white people's homes. And he noticed wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and um, electricity. And then he said, and I seen toilets that flush. Mm -hmm. I never seen, you know, that. So this must be what success is mm -hmm. in mainstream. So I guess I, I got to get these things to be whatever that is successful in, in, the, in, the, in the mainstream America. So that's that. And then the guy's reading a book and he's reading The Black Stallion. So I went and I didn't know what that book cover looked like. So I searched uh, 1940s Black Stallion. That supposedly is the cover, looks like the cover. But yeah, so those things too, you know, talk about humor. It's pretty dark, but then you got a guy on a toilet in full regalia too. Well, I also think it breaks that mythology, right? Because I think the work is about breaking those conceptions. The idea of the stoic, you know, native that is like, Always, I mean, where do natives exist? Only on a horse. They'd never be on a on a toilet. They'd never be, you know. Uh, I love the, you know, the mask character up in the corner with the briefcase and the. Oh tie, yeah, that's right? him. Yeah. So playing off of that, it, it reminds me a little bit of like um, uh, uh, Ryan Singer's work, um, you know, where he blends, you know, uh, Diné and Navajo backgrounds and puts Star Wars yes. in the foregrounds, um, you know, or it's an auntie that's weaving and she's weaving Baby Yoda. Yeah. like up on her on her you know on her, her weaving board um and jay garcia's work too yeah. um and you know jay does that too he's got people in traditional you know regalia or whatever pueblo folks in traditional regalia and you know with a cup of starbucks right <laughs> or like one of the you know it's a girl usually he does a lot you know with his daughters and he draws you know he does art with them and they're thinking about pokemon right and there are some folks in the community that that's not traditional enough right that's like oh we don't like that because this is this is really ceremonies are really important. And I was like, but that's what we do. Like yes. we come into ceremony or we're in regalia, and I've got a Starbucks cup because I've had to come from work to go to to go to dances or to go to feast days or whatever, right? Like sometimes that happens, yeah. and it's not like it's not even reconciling our histories. Like our histories were like that. We have colonies. We have Laguna colonies. But yes, we were colonizers. Um, we just call them colonies because <laughs> it's where a whole bunch of Laguna folks ended up. Uh, off the railroad line so we were working on the railroad lines and so like at the rail stops that's because it was too hard to get back and back and forth at home we set up just little we set up little boxcar colonies mm -hmm. and we make little boxcar plazas and so we recreated home again speaking of diaspora right mm -hmm. we recreated home by creating a little plaza where we would do ceremonial pieces a lot of times coming back for like main dances main pieces these guys would be just getting like right off the train and having to get into you know, regalia as quick as they, some things got missed, mm -hmm. you know, and not intentionally. It's just didn't have the time to do 
what they were doing 100 years before that. And so tradition changes, right? And the practices begin to change in some of these ways because of, and even, I mean, they talk about it with the box. I was like, you know, we're practicing our traditions and our and our beliefs. So I think it's that breakthrough as well. I love that because I think it's that breakthrough of like, no, no, this is, you know, this is a potty, I sleep, you know, I'm not constantly riding a horse. So, yeah. So I was kind of going back to that. <clears throat> so being like you're in class, <clears throat> yes, kind of like the faith thing is always it's always about grounding, right? It's always about the truth. And as of, like the three of you, like it's, it's awesome kind of like you teach the passions and you teach your now it's like it gives hope for our identity as a whole. <clears throat> but then it's also how do we not forget about this past? And how to both, I guess, move together without putting, putting one over the other. And that brings up, like, kind of my next question with that is, like, I've, I've read books where we have scholars that are kind of writing about the traditional knowledge, and then yet there's no acknowledgement of that traditional knowledge in their works. So they're, they're pretty much like stepping on the heads of of the traditional knowledge to elevate themselves. However, like each one of your words aren't aren't any of that. So like how can we move together where both both are elevated in the same light and importance where being indigenous we're all, all kind of fighting for I mean survival. I'll just go I've to, I've I've always framed it like this and just as an image is that all of that is 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 a backpack. And I don't go anywhere without a bagger. I mean, I did tonight, but I usually always go somewhere without a, you know, I never leave my backpack. I was a kid that like, I started developing like, you know, whatever it was like bone problems because my, I'd carry everything I could in my back, anything I could possibly need. I'd throw a pack of cards, bubble gum, books, and a, 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 like a teddy bear, anything I could, I always had a backpack. And that's how I always view that balance. Tradition is something I'm always carrying with me. It's my backpack. And it's whenever I need that thing to help me because my ancestors made sure to keep those tools for me. They gave me that knowledge and my responsibility is to care for that as well. I don't, I don't ditch my backpack. I don't dump it out. I don't throw the stuff out. I keep it with me. And, and all those tools that are in there, I think the backpack can be huge. It's like a bag of holding, right? You can, there's always something else to grab out of there, you know, as, especially as you, dig deeper you're like oh wait there's some oh there's there's a there's a lamp shade and you know whatever right like I think it's it's infinite and so for me that's how I always try to view it is because our ancestors wanted us to keep moving forward creator wanted us to keep moving forward and I know it's silly but it's it was an elder that told me he's like that's why we have eyes you know on the front of our head right and I that doesn't make sense but it does right <laughs> it's one of those statements that it's just like well but if it was on the back then we'd go back anyway but I just, I like that, that framing of it. So for me, that's, that's how I find the balance is that I always think of that. And I'm always remembering to, to talk about the folks that went before me. I mean, you, I mean, you said it, like, I don't not, I mean, in the class specifically, not necessarily here as much, but I'm always talking about other folks. I'm always talking about where I got, I got to because other folks did where I got here because other folks survived. I mean, that's ultimately that my family, you know, we had, you know, our genocide back in 16, you know, 1680, right? The, you know, and the, and, the, and the Pueblo Rebellion, the massacres that happened leading up to that and after. And I'm here because that ancestral line lived. But I'm also really, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my, the indigenous side, my mom's side is just important, you know? So like remembering all of that, that's how we carry all of that forward with us. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I had a bunch of thoughts in my head and they just went away. Sorry. Oh. Uh, one of the things that um, that I, you know, I, I've always gardened. I have a million plants in the house and ask Paul if they're crazy. Um, yes, I do. My children are shaking their heads. And, you know, that continue, that continuous practice of nurturing is something that I was taught by my grandmother. And I, that is such an essential part of me because it doesn't just go to my plants, it goes to my kids. It goes to my students who I really try to nurture. And I try, I do tell them at the beginning of every semester that um, 
You know, it is quite possible that I will be the only Indigenous person in front of the room for you in your entire educational career, and it's terrible. But, you know, I am also very fortunate to be here um, considering all the atrocities that and the genocide that happened to my people. And, you know, when 90, 95% of my people on all my sides didn't survive these moments of, you know, historic annihilation, um, you know, we were, they were smart enough to leave, move, regroup, spend time alone in isolation and survive and then come back together. And it's never lost on me that um, I am quite honored to be here, that um, it was because of the knowledge and, you know, that they knew how to survive together. And so, you know, I always carry my people with me, but then my academic mentor, um, who is not of my nation, she gave she gave me this mental war, uh, war chest, and that's what she calls it. It's your war chest, and you will always find things. She's like, these are these moments, and you're going to put this in there, and you're gonna close that lid, and you're going to hang on to it for later because you'll need it. And so it, when I get in these tough moments, oh. like this weekend where somebody presented funerary objects to us, um, you know, there were a lot of lessons in those moments. And I opened that box and I took things out, but I also put things back in. And so for me within academia, you know, that box, that, the tools that I have in there have helped me survive because, you know, this is hard being a, a PhD student here, being a grad student um, in any of these institutions, being an undergrad, it's all been really, really hard work. Um, but I have never left my people behind, right? I can't. And um, so when I do my work on the art of other indigenous folks, I have to respect their, their histories and their people and hope that I can do them justice when I write about them, because you know that's the scariest thing is to write about somebody else and to honor to honor their people and their ancestors. That's a, a hard question to answer because I've always I never like to uh, tell people what to do. I always just like to show you know, like I talked about how I was first an artist and then how I grew into becoming a why I became an instructor and why I moved back home to contribute positive. Like, that's what I really would like people to do is, you know, um, go back and help their community. Um, but sometimes that's not possible either. But um, you can outside, you still can do that. Um, as I get older, I'm, I'm starting to preach, I think. So I said, <laughs> well, I, I think I can do it now because I have done it. Okay. I mean, I've lived. Yeah. Not as old as Paul yet, but <laughs> there, there, nobody. Yeah, but <laughs> nobody's as nice. Right, I had to get one more gig. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, if they, you know, ask, ask the community what they want. You know, even that part of my job is to keep an ear out what my community wants. And I live there, and I'm the head of the our tribal college. I still have to listen to what they might want, and I think that's a key. Listen to what your people want. So. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, if we have no more questions from the, the group or the panel, um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Indigenous speaker group here and to thank Paul for making this all happen. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for coming and showing us, sharing with us your knowledge. And it's been a real inspiration to myself and to, I'm sure, all the other students here. Uh, just a reminder to any students, there is a clipboard going around. If you could sign it just to prove you're here. <laughs> Get more. <laughs> prove your identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with that, I'd like to thank everyone and um, close it out here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And you just gave me a story. Did I? The war chest. Or just... Seriously, I had just I wrote the first lines. You, you, you're going to be a character now. I'm going to be a character. I, I try to be a character. I just in don't have story, comedic, not in, I don't in have the comedic world. timing. No, it was, uh, it's, I, I was just like, uh, 
He had always seen it in the corner, and it always just did. And it's just going to have an adventure in this project. I think that she needs to get it. It looks like it's the hips, but she.